So this is uh, episode 17 on life on life's terms. Um, this is a, a solo a solo episode. It's just you and I on this episode. Uh, we'll have Kenny in tomorrow. Um, but I would encourage you to go to the Patreon uh, Patreon webpage, Life on Life's Terms dot Patreon dot com or something like that, and uh, support Southside Legion. Like I said, any uh, as we stated before, any any of the contributions uh, over the next I think three weeks left will be given to Southside Boxing Legion, and uh, what we will what they'll do is they'll post all of the the money that was contributed to us on their Facebook and webpage so that you know that all funds went to them and we didn't take any ourselves. So the reason why we're doing a, or why I'm doing a solo episode is, uh, I think just to wrap up some of the episodes that we've had so far, uh, I think, uh, this is a great opportunity to do so. I have some other guests coming in later on, but, uh, I mean, I think the first seven episodes seven episodes were just me talking about how I got into recovery and um, what life was like. So one of the things I had heard was, do I find it difficult to work for people? And uh, I mean, I've had, I've had a number of jobs uh, in recovery. I've worked at detox centers and I've, I've even worked for survey firms and uh, not messed them up. Um, however, the work that I enjoy today is uh, working in recovery. I like, I, I thoroughly enjoy uh, mentoring men and women along their journey of recovery. And um, I'm quite fond of doing big book studies. And I'm also quite fond of uh, talking to people on Facebook or even through my uh, website about maybe some of the issues that they may be going through with recovery. Um, so that's basically, you know, my background is recovery. We've, uh, we've interviewed many people on this show, um, including boxers all the way to wrestlers, pro football player guys, uh, as well as a guy who, Chris Suchet, who was, I think that was an amazing podcast. If you guys haven't heard it, go to um, check out the evolution of, of addiction treatment. Uh, we, we went in real deep, you know, there was a wealth of uh, knowledge that uh, that episode was about. And I learned a significant amount about treatment and um, where we started from and, and what we're at today. Uh, it was, it was fantastic. And uh, I, I learned, I learned a hell of a lot of stuff in, in that, in that episode. Uh, we had Rick in last week, which was a really good episode about boxers and, and the difference between training in Canada and, and training in Puerto Rico and uh, the, um, I guess, the uh, financial evolution of, of boxing in Canada. Um, I was discussing with somebody a little while ago about how, you know, the, the the poverty gap is so deep in Canada that even people who are impoverished still can't afford to go and box. I mean, this is a big reason why we're, we're putting on this um, contribution for Southside Le- uh, Boxing Legion so that they can get some of those poverty-stricken kids or children into their boxing programs. Because even, I mean, essentially for boxing, all it costs is a pair of shoes. And a lot of these kids who are in uh, financially depressed areas, uh, they can't come up with the appropriate footwear in order to be able to uh, participate in a boxing program, let alone trying to participate in a good old Canadian hockey game. And uh, I think that's really unfortunate. Another episode that really sticks out in my mind that we had just a little while ago was... uh, was the episode with uh, Big Jeff. Meet Big Jeff. Um, Big Jeff is probably going to come back in for another episode here, hopefully in the next two to three weeks. Um, If not, I mean, that's okay. Uh, I'm sure he'll come in at some point in the future, but uh, as far as I know, he's doing well, and uh, he's continuing on the the road of recovery so far, which uh, that's all we can really hope for 
can't expect it, but we can hope for it, you know? Um, and so talking to, uh, talking to Jeff, I mean, he's really, in, uh, seems to be encouraged and engaged in, in, uh, getting back out there and working, um, with youth and also with people who are out of the corrections, you know? So, you know, I, I've been trying to encourage him to continue on that. And, and if there's any way that I can help him, I'm going to be helping him. Um, so I guess one of the other things too, that, uh, I forgot to touch on from before was I said that there was a story about something that I would catch up on later. Well, that this is what that story is. So I was in a place called Lac La Biche when I was serving in the oil field. And uh, I completely blacked this out. Apparently, I went to a carnival and I had a fantastic time with this woman. Uh, and one of the benchmarks that I kind of remember is I was up in a, what do you call it, like a, a, a Ferris wheel? Yeah, a Ferris wheel. And uh, screaming my head off. And, and uh, I ended up, I wasn't able to get back to the, to the hotel. And so I ended up sleeping in a ditch that night. Uh, on the side of the highway because the hotel I was in was quite quite a distance from the town of Lac La Biche, Alberta. And so, uh, so anyways, I totally blacked this out and only three, th so this happened in my early 20s, I was about 24. I'm 34 now and uh, I, I totally didn't even know that this happened until three years ago. Three years ago, I remembered this story going, you know, shit, <laughs> that, that that actually happened, right? And it was coming back to me in flashbacks. I find I've been getting, fla like, throughout this time of recovery, I get flashbacks. One of the things that I can definitely suggest anybody who's in recovery or, yeah, well, in recovery, I guess, is when it comes to thinking about your past, I mean, a lot of our past is just a bunch of bullshit. We don't even know what really the re the truth is and what the lies are. So this is what I would encourage anybody to do is, is think about the feelings that happened about the past. You can't lie about feelings. Um, and talk about the goals that are coming forward because I've, I've caught myself in a thing called denial where I didn't even know I lied because I had been saying the story for so long. I really thought it was true. And then I was like, shit, that's not true after I said that. And then, I, you know, it's, it's just an awkward conversation when you're talking to somebody and you're like, hey, man, um, remember yesterday I told you that hilarious story? Well, the truth of the matter is it wasn't true. And, you know, I, I didn't mean to lie to you, but I did. I just, you know, it's it's a fucked up situation when you lie and you didn't even know that you you did lie, right, until afterwards. So that, that can, uh, that's some advice, some free advice I, I can hand off to you is there's no real point in talking about specificities unless 100% you know that they're correct. Um, so a lot of my story when I had engaged in that story earlier uh, in the podcast series, a lot of that stuff I know for sure happened. I think there's only one instance where I talked about a situation where I wasn't sure if it had happened or what really happened, but I ended up getting arrested for it anyways. Um, so there, there was that instance. Uh, and I can, I can truly say to you that I don't know what happened. It was another blackout moment. And, and uh, if, if it were to ever come back to me and I had to make amends, I would definitely be willing to make amends today. Um, one of the things I'll talk to you about is I'm, I'm, uh, I was sitting, so I was, I was sitting at home and, um, all of a sudden this unknown number pops up on my phone and it's like, Hey, is this Justin? And, um, I was like, uh, well, who are you? <laughs> uh, and, and I mean, I go to a lot of, uh, detox centers in the area that I'm in. In order, and, and talk about recovery and, and what that looks like and, and how we go about getting recovered. And I, I've given my number out to a lot of people. However, the people who call are, nobody calls, really. Uh, where I typically get um, sponsees or people to mentor is through meetings and other avenues and venues that I, that I engage in. Anyways, this guy basically messages me and he's like uh, are you Justin and I'm like who are you and then we chit chat back and forth and um, I always tell people call me before you use but 
call me even after you use so that we can figure out how you don't have to use again. And uh, that's kind of where this guy was at, you know, he, uh, he was, he's, he, he was just reaching out and, and it, it struck me a little bit strange. And then he was talking about my old life and one of the messages and I was like, oh shit, is this guy coming for me basically? You know, that was the thought in my head. And, um, I was really apprehensive because uh, last thing I need in my life today is is an ambush of any sort. Call it paranoid, but as I had stated before, I, w- I was affiliated with organized crime, and um, and and I have not participated in that uh, ever in my recovery. I uh, I did everything that I possibly could do in order to distance myself from that from that lifestyle and that world. And so, anyways. I was, uh, I had to make a decision if I was going to meet this guy or not. And, uh, like I haven't felt that kind of anxiety in a really long time that I couldn't trust somebody or I had to doubt trusting somebody. And so I sat back and I really, I really, really had to think about this. And I asked myself three questions and first question was, is it selfish to go and see him? And I thought, well, no, it's not really selfish. It's, it's of service. Then um, the next question was, was anybody going to get hurt? I thought, well, I might be able, I might get hurt, but but in this moment, I don't qualify. Uh, if it means being martyred, it means being martyred. I'm not playing a martyr. I'm just saying that I'm, I'm my intentions are to go and help somebody. My intentions are not to hurt somebody. And uh, if it ends up being a setup, I'm sure law of the universe or the God of my understanding, whatever you want to call it, We'll work it out in that moment. And then the last question I asked myself was, uh, was is it of service? And it definitely qualifies for service. So I was hell bent on um, being able to go and see this this guy. So in the interim time of going to go see him, uh, from the time that he messaged me to the inter- in, through the interim time of the time that I went and saw him, which was elapsed about 24 hours or so, I had another guy that I worked with years and years ago who overdosed, ended up in the hospital. And uh, when he was in the hospital, his wife and chi- his wife and mother were coming out of coming from out of town to come and see uh, see him in the hospital that he was in in the city that that I'm currently in at the moment. And uh, he didn't make it. You know, he he died that morning, and I remember vividly. Uh, messaging this guy saying, you know, every sober breath that I breathe that I'm conscious for, uh, especially in the morning, I pay homage to all the men and women that I've seen die through recovery because they're dying to get what I have been given so freely today, you know, and that's, that's the honest to God truth. I mean, I've seen a hell of a lot of people die. I've seen more people die in recovery than I've ever seen live in like, or die in, in active addiction. Sorry. And, uh, I mean, this disease takes this disease of addiction. Doesn't give a fuck how, how rich you are, how poor you are, what color you are, what side of the tracks you come from, where you've been in your life. It doesn't, it doesn't give a shit about any of that. The only thing it cares about is how it can fuck up your life. That's all it cares about. All it cares about is when it comes calling, how quickly do you respond? How quickly do you answer? And as I sat there, knowing that this guy had died 2.30 in the morning, I thought, fuck, I, you know, the, next, the guy that I see tomorrow, there's still hope. You know, there's still hope. I used to hold a lot of weight on my shoulders thinking I'm the guy that can save all of these people. When I realized I'm not the guy to save anybody, that when as soon as I start playing that white knight jumping on a on a horse, what I've come to understand is that I'm really being codependent in that moment. I'm trying to engage in somebody to be their hero and save their life. I thought to myself, no man, that's that's you know, I, when, when I did that in the past, I had I had come to recognize, actually it's my sponsor who recognized this fault of mine. And he had said to me, he said, you better rectify that fucking bullshit right now because you ain't going to save anybody. 
That's not your mission on life or your mission in this world. Our mission in this world is to be a living example of the best human you can be every day. Because there are people who have died to get that sober breath that you draw, you drew freely this morning. And he said, how dare you ever forget that? And, uh, you know, that those words, they, they, uh, they sing a truth to me, you know? And, um, so like I said, I, I met this guy, uh, the next day and I was still pretty nervous, you know, uh, I trusted in my higher power and I, I really thought, you know, you know, no, nothing's going to happen. Um, but I had a lot of anxiety. I mean, I was going into the territory of, uh, where this organized crime um, affiliation I have is in the town, like where they're predominant in this in this town, and uh, I basically went going into the lion's den geographically, so to say, and uh, that really freaked me out, man. That really freaked me out, and so I'm sitting there, and uh, I I even pulled some of the old techniques of you know. Uh, making things early and being there early and sitting in the corner and a whole bunch of stuff that you learn in that kind of life in order to uh, bet your hedges in a safe way for yourself. And so I had did all of that just to protect myself. I even reached out to my sponsor to see if he'd be able to come with me uh, so that there was two of us there. And uh, he ended up being sick and, and physically sick. And so he wasn't able to make it, but I did create like this, uh, this text line. So I gave them certain times. If I don't text you back at this time, just call the police. Like, don't even text me, just call the police. And so as soon as I met with this fellow, I was, I was, uh, very enthusiastically happy that I could just text my sponsor and say, Hey man, it's, it's all good. You know, well, this is going to be an all right, an all right, uh, meeting with this fella. And uh, we continued. And one of the things that I had recognized as I'm sitting there talking to this prospect, that's, that's basically the language out of, uh, out of the program that I, I have subscribed to called Alcoholics Anonymous or Cocaine Anonymous, Blue Book Friendly, as they say. I had realized as I'm looking at this guy that the enthusiasm of the hope that we provide doesn't come from any facade and it's not a personification that we have. It's the true value of waking up every day and allowing our thoughts to perpetuate who we have become. Because all of a sudden, no longer is there shitty committee running in the back of our heads. And no longer is there, there this negative nanny or nitwit or whatever you want to call it dragging us down. Every day when we wake up, our thoughts are the things that push us to what we become. You know, I never would have ever thought that if thinking about who you can be is all you need for the catalyst, and as long as you can aspire to the motivation to continue that, you're going to become that. And I never thought that that was possible, but it's, it's truly that easy. There's a bunch of shit that we do on the road to that but eventually it becomes very very simple and I remember in the beginning of this process we call recovery these fucking assholes would tell me all the time it's so easy it's gonna blow your mind how easy it is and um, I can attest to that today it is easy it is easy waking up and doing what I want to do and and I don't generate a huge income but I, I generate an income that I'm comfortable in. I feel rich today. I don't, I don't waste any time in anything I don't want to do. That, that doesn't even qualify in my world today. I don't have a J-O-B. I don't have an obligation that sucks. I don't have any of that. All I have in my life is something that I want to do and I enjoy doing it. So back to sitting with this fella one of the things that I had witnessed was how quick the hook was sunk into him in the context of how willing he was ready to change. Now, I mean, 
everybody's willing to change in the beginning, but when you or somebody, when you are, are given these proposals that we call steps and you're given a, an alternative way to change your life, I don't give a fuck if you're an addict or you're a normal person. Nobody likes change. And the second that you be able uh, that you become comfortable with change, you're going to find that success in life is going to become easier. And the reason why that is is because the world is not Justin's world. The world is the world and Justin only participates in that world. That's all that matters. And how I contribute to that world is truly what matters. It's not about me taking what I uh, what I deserve or what I feel is mine. That's not the way it works. I thought it did for a really long time. But there's apparently these places called jails that are filled with people who think the exact same way as me. And so now what do I understand about living in a way where I contribute to the world? What I have come to understand when I contribute to the world is I earn what is given to me. Like I said, I don't, I don't pull in a lot of money. But what I do pull in is self-satisfaction. I am successful every day. I knock down my goals. My personal goals are what matter to me. And that's all that really matters to me on a daily basis. If something comes my way because of the world, well, that's only a reflection of the work that I'm putting into the world and what I'm contributing to it. You see, it's not about changing the world. It's about changing myself. And by changing myself in direct in direct influence, the world is going to change as well. My ripple effect is going out. It's not coming into me. That's how this thing or this philosophy of life works. You want to know the true reality of success means that you have no want for yourself at the end of the day. You feel exhausted in the fact that you have knocked down all of those things that you've placed in front of yourself in order to feel good about what you've done. That's what matters. It doesn't matter that you made money today. It doesn't matter that you had an eight-hour J-O-B that you went and plugged away at and you put a fucking punch ticket in, pulled that son of a bitch out, and you got your measly paycheck at the end of two weeks. That doesn't matter because I can assure you you may have a king of the day, king, uh, a king of the week check, but I feel like a king every day. I don't have to wait every two weeks. Every day I wake up, I am enthusiastically enthralled about what I'm going to be doing that day. So, what is it exactly that I do? Well, I'm I'm currently the executive director and a founder of a not-for-profit called Saint Dismas House Society. What is it that we do? Well, what we do is we provide short-term housing for emergency short-term housing for men who are coming out of incarceration or detox who are seeking a treatment date for their addiction. We provide a conducive environment towards abstinence living in a short-term emergency housing setting so that clients will be able to participate in treatment regardless of their marginalized housing situation and regardless of what they've used 30 to 50 days prior to getting into treatment. Treatment centers at that moment are able to count on the fact that clients coming out of our facility will be ready and willing and able to participate in treatment. So in saying that, um, we are currently in the process of getting a building going, uh, which means renovations, so on and so forth, the, the appropriate approvals. And uh, we should expect clients in our building sooner than later. Now, back to um, practicing success. We need to practice success in the utmost respect, and that is by setting up goals for ourselves that are that is difficult enough for us to feel like it's just out of reach but it's always attainable provided that we push 10 percent more than what we did yesterday and if we're continually focused upon that goal that goal becomes the main focal point of our daily progression 
and this is measurable. And we, were, we are going to find very quickly, outside of that, that life in things that we're not even really in charge of. So, for instance, life on life's terms. Hence why this podcast is called this. We're not in charge of that. And we have to live life on its terms, not on my terms. And so to be able to be conducive, to live life on life's terms, one of the things that I can do is I can work out in the morning so that I can know I, I, I can defeat that challenge. I can make sure that I read a minimum of 100 pages a day within a book. I can make sure that when I close my eyes, my thoughts will perpetuate what I am going to become. When I meditate, I go along a walk with my higher power in order for us to secure what my future is going to be like. I need to practice the feeling of success while I'm in the middle of that meditation because that is so important. If I do not, if I do not take that responsibility on for myself in the context of practicing what success feels like, as soon as I'm presented with it, I'm going to run away from it like, an, like a dog who's afraid of, of a potential visitor, okay, or, or a visitor in my life. So keeping, these on, keeping this point on track, as I was sitting across this from this fellow on, on Sunday, I had realized, you know, there's so much potential. But when we present the success to this guy, is he going to take it on? Is he going to go and do it? And see, even this guy who I'm speaking about, what, what we need to recognize is I've met scores of men who are in the same spot that he's been in in life. So I may particularly be talking about one fella on Sunday, but the reality is, is I'm talking about two, maybe even 400 men that I've talked to. Because you see, addiction doesn't scare the addict. What scares the addict is the success that comes from no longer using. We all say we want it, but the reality is, is are you prepared to change anything and everything in an upheaval way and in a very rapid, rapid way in order to become successful and not be bound by anything in your life? That's the real question. I mean, you ought to want to. But do you really want to? Has it gotten so bad, your life, and I don't give a shit if it's drugs, booze, sex, food, whatever, whatever it may be, fucking chapstick, has it gotten so bad that you're willing to even change the good? Because that's what it comes down to. The bullshit that you think has been saving your ass is keeping you sick. This isn't about saying, I'd like to give this away, but I want to keep this. That doesn't work for anybody. I've even done this program with normal people where their life has been profoundly changed. The way of living through the principles of a 12-step program can profoundly change anybody because it's geared towards, it's geared towards success. It's geared towards goal-setting and exceeding those goals, and realizing that your thinking potential is unlimited. And if your thinking potential is unlimited, what that also means is that your thoughts are what you become. That's just a reality. If you ask for it, it will be given. If you seek, you will find it. These are the principles of life. This is what it is. Nobody, nobody is stopping you from your, from your potential. If there's anything that the addict has a leg up upon anybody who's normal is we have been afflicted with adversity, unsurmountable at times. Yet, we are, we are so resourceful, even in our active addiction, we can move past that. I mean, I was talking to a family member of an addict uh, I think today or maybe yesterday. And they were saying to me, well, what happens if we just close the door? I said, do you think that 
he's this this person this member of your family who's an addict is going to be out on the street it's not going to happen addicts are resourceful they'll be able to figure it out they'll burn all the bridges to the bottom but the reality is is you're no longer participating and that's what matters no longer are you enabling their actions towards active addiction or in the throes of active addiction I said, at least you can go home, know that you can shut your phone off and not have to worry about them. Because the next time that they call, it's either going to be from jail, a hospital, a detox, or a treatment center. And God willing, God willing, it's not the coroner's office calling you saying, can you come and identify your child? I mean, I wouldn't wish that upon anybody. And yes, it's true. As I had started off this podcast, many of us die. That's a reality. But you're not going to stop anybody from dying. Nobody stops anybody from dying. I think I think one of the worst cases I uh, uh, and this one I always go back to because this this uh, this was really difficult. I had a guy that I had I was working with for two years, and um, he was sober. He had a little bit of mental health issues, but he went to go and talk to a psych uh, psych uh, psychologist. Yeah, it was a psychologist. And um, he got he got upset with the psychologist. And he walked out of the psychologist and he basically said to the psychologist, you don't have a fucking clue what you're talking about. I'm going to show you. And uh, this guy jumped on his motorbike and, and he hit the back of a, of a city transport bus at 140 kilometers an hour. Purposely. And... Um, I mean, this is how fucked up our minds are, right? I'll show you. Look at look at how I'm going to hurt myself. I mean, how the fuck does that show anybody? And I really cared for this guy. I mean, he was he was a, a good friend of mine, and it was really really difficult to take. But what I what I took away from that, and what I learned was, we're not stopping anybody if they're destined to kill themselves. If this is what they really want, there's fuck all we can do. You know, you can you can cut the brake lines of somebody's vehicle so they can't leave. But guess what? They they may still run off a fucking bridge, right? They may still run into an oncoming vehicle. They may even hit a person if you do that. I mean, your intentions are that they don't leave. But they're still going to leave somehow, some way. There's, there, there, there's nothing you can do to stop them. You know, we're only here for the ride. We're not here to control it. You know, you're, you're just a participant. You're not somebody who drives the bus. The only thing that that uh, that we are in control of is, like I said, those 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 little challenges that we can present ourselves physically, spiritually and emotionally. And so the way how you do this spiritually is, you know, how long can you meditate for? You know? And can you beat that the next day? Not beat it in the sense of a competition, but can you beat it in a way where you were able to enjoy it for an extra three more minutes? And then when it comes to emotions, are you able to sit there through a barrage of what may feel like to you of people being abusive towards you but the reality might be that you're just playing a victim and think your way through that. Are you capable of doing that? Are you capable of really looking at what's going on as opposed to saying, well, fuck that. That guy's just an asshole. He's, he's, he's just trying to beat me up uh, verbally because that's probably not the truth. And, and more, more increasingly, the reality is, 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 is probably if this person is being malicious towards you, they may not even realize that they are. So emotionally, are you stable enough not to not to increase the conflict, but are you able to, t- to sit there and tell this person how you feel? Because if you tell them how you feel, then all of a sudden they may realize that, shoot, they, they, they might be malicious towards you. Or their actions are malicious towards you. 
then you might have actually incited some change in somebody else without having to say, you know what you ought to do? You know what you should do? Because those two words are th those two phrases, I should say, are things that I never really want to say to anybody. The one thing that I definitely say quite a bit is what we have to do and what we need to prepare ourselves for and what we are aspired to pull within our life are these things. Those statements have served me very well. And the reason for it is because I truly believe that we're just a team. And we're a team in the progress of success. And the success is measurable by being able to know that we're successful in our daily goals. Because really, that's all that matters. That's all that really matters. Did you hurt anybody today? No. You know, if you can answer that in a positive way, well, guess what? Check mark for you. Gold star plus plus. I had one guy that I worked with, you know, he lent somebody $20 and it doesn't seem like a big deal, but this guy was a real gangster, you know, he was really trying to change his life. And so, you know, the best that he could do is he only started smacking this guy every time he saw him because the motherfucker didn't pay him, you know? But to him, that was better than throwing him in the trunk of his car and driving him to the middle of fucking nowhere but fuck Saskatchewan and placing him in between some township road and range road that nobody, God, even knows where it is and just left him there. Smacking him was a better option than that. Sure, it's not great. You know, I don't condone violence towards people. But in his, in, in, in his regard, in that early phase of his recovery... That was a bonus, you know, and then and then this guy finally realized that he can't handle lending people money because when they don't pay, it's really hard for him just to write that shit off in his head. Now, today, he just doesn't give a shit. So that's progress. Like I said, we're a team for the progress of success. That's what this podcast is set up to do. We bring in people who are just normal people talking about how they've progressively heeded success in their life, whether it be through listening to other people, learning from their mistakes, and applying the implications that we have suggested, or they come to us and they tell us how they have employed certain suggestions from other faucets into their life and and we get to share this with you as the listener. I enjoy doing this podcast very much. I mean, I I uh I really enjoy putting this thing together and and I have a lot of fun doing it and I hope you have a lot of fun uh I hope you have enjoyable times listening to to sometimes the rambling ons. And uh you know, I I I am going to continue this for 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 probably a long time. So uh, I'm sure as time goes on, this podcast will get better and better and better. Um, again, about this guy on on Sunday who I had seen, or call it the last 400 men who never showed up. Uh, but this guy, I mean, we don't know if he's not going to show up or not. I guess I'll bring that into another you and me episode later on in the future. I'm hopeful that he will. But I was talking to a fella a little while ago as well, and, and he said, well, we need to discern if people are ready for the program or a program of change or some sort of advantage to change in life. And I said, every time I bet on a guy not making it in my own head, I utterly failed. I was wrong. Every time I bet that a guy would make it, I failed there too. I said, you don't know who's ready and who's not ready. That's that's not what you know. What you know is that they qualify to try. That's what matters. They qualify to try. You put it upon them to be accountable to change their life. There's nothing you can do to motivate them anymore. And to bet your hedges. This is this is a a bet nobody's winning. 
you're more likely, in my opinion, to win the damn lottery than betting on an addict if they're going to get recovery or not. What we, what, what, what we can never know is somebody's motivation. Everybody is highly motivated in the beginning. But when they come to realize that this is not a sprint and it's a marathon, that's when thoughts start changing. So I'm going to give this, seg- this part of this podcast to families directly. If you are supporting an addict... In my opinion, the best things that we can do is make a hard line. We call them out on their bullshit when we find out that they're lying to us. And if they decide not to subscribe to honesty, honesty within their lives or honesty to us, then maybe we have to reassess the relationship that we have with that person. Secondly, we need to also only condone behaviors that are conducive towards sobriety living. Not necessarily full abstinence in this context. I do believe that things like Kratom and sometimes ayahuasca and Suboxone and Methadone are great tools for addicts. But we cannot condone them using substances, whether it be alcohol, cigarettes, whatever their, their addictive behavior is killing them with. We cannot condone or endorse that behavior. Because we've crossed a big line, and that line becomes we are enablers. We cannot, we cannot cross that line. The second that that boundary has been, has been blurred and we cross it, we're going to cross it time and time again because all of a sudden it's not going to be visible of where that line starts and where that line ends. It's just going to blow away in the sand. Third, if said family member decides to relapse well communication only then starts again when they call us from a detox a treatment the jail or hospital we can no longer engage them when they decide to utilize behaviors that are not conducive towards a healthy relationship with you And this is the biggest one, I think, this last point is the biggest one that supporters of the family need to recognize. You're just as sick as the addict in your family. You've been hanging on to their chaos, and you've been addicted to their chaos. How many times do you look at your phone hoping that they text you? How many times do you hope that there's a message on your phone? How many times that do you hope when they ask you for money... That at least they're asking you for money and you know that they're alive. Okay? What I suggest is this. You set up a date. And you say on Saturday, let's say, for example, you're allowed to call me between the hours of 6.30 and 7.30. But outside of that time, provided that you're not in treatment or detox, hospital or jail, you cannot call me because I do not feel confident that you are sober. And when you call me on Saturday in the evening... I would expect that you would be sober at that moment as well. And if they're not, then you simply hang up at you, answer and you say, I was, it's nice to hear you, but it doesn't sound like you're sober at the moment. Can you call me next Saturday? Love you very much. Talk to you then. Bye for now. And that's it. And at the very least, you will feel hopefully better in knowing that they've called you. Some people say that... I'm really strict in what I'm saying, and you need to love them. Well, guess what? I've seen more families love people to to death than love them into recovery. Okay? And for the wives specifically is this, or parents if you're taking care of children, children for addicts. Don't give them their family back right away. I've seen people get their families back quite rapidly, because the motivation is still there within early recovery. So let's kind of put boundaries around what the context of early recovery is. That's three years. From the time that they start a true program of sobriety, not abstinence, sobriety, early recovery is three years. In that time, I would suggest that anybody who's in recovery should, and I don't say that word lightly, but should, have done a set of steps 
whether it be through Smart Recovery, AA, NA, CA, whatever fucking A saves your ass. Okay, that's what you got to do. And you have to sponsor. You have to be a mentor. So for families who are watching this addict in their life, it's not about being fooled. It's about making sure they make it past the sprint and they're now running on the long marathon. Because if there's anything that an addict cannot promise you, is they cannot promise you a relapse. They cannot promise you that they're not going to relapse. The only thing an addict can promise you is that they're willing to continue a life of sobriety through a program of sobriety. Which means even if they relapse, they'll go back to meetings. Which means if they relapse, hopefully you'll listen to the, suge- the suggestions prior and, ad- and adhere to those so that you do not fall into the soup of enabling. Because that's, that's what's important. And we as addicts, we recognize that. After some time of, of, of recovery, we, we recognize how we were manipulating, manipulating all of our relationships in order to get that enabling out of the person. In my past podcast, you heard that I had said my mom just stopped answering the phone. And there was a time when I called her phone and I, and I literally left a message saying, this is the sound of me dying. And I was dying on the phone. Um, and my mom never called me back the next day. She just knew I was alive. That's all that mattered. You know, and, and uh, I could only imagine how much that killed my mom. My mom is going to be on the podcast um, in the near future, and I'm sure she's going to explain what some of those emotions felt like for for you listeners, because I think that's uh, very, very important to hear that, right? And what's the flip side of recovery, the good side, because I've talked a lot about death in this in this uh, in this episode and the realities of what recovery is and expectations, what that what that looks like. Well, the flip side of recovery is is when we're running this thing great through our sponsor's help and, and continuing our service work, so on and so forth, doing the things that we need to do. Life is fantastic. I mean, we have a great, typically most of us have a good job. Typically, whether we have criminal records or not, typically most of us are highly motivated individuals and we have this skill to be able to deal with adversity that not many people really have. So we, we can demonstrate that in our work. We also have enthusiasm out the wazoo, so to say, you know, we're, we as addicts, and I speak wholly about this, like in the context of the whole of, of addicts, um, as a majority, these are just attributing factors that we have. I mean, you know, drugs and alcohol were not my problem. My problem was the way how I thought about things. And today I have found a way not to fall back into that thinking. It can happen, but I have a sponsor who kind of yanks my leash, right? So today, I mean, I can go to folk fests and not not smoke weed and not drink and be okay. I can go to blues fests and the same thing. I can go I can go wherever the hell I want and be okay with life. I'm not going to relapse because of the circumstantial situation around me. I've come to recognize that if a relapse is going to be prevalent in my life, it's because my thinking is going sideways or I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking or humbling myself in front of a power greater than myself, the, the God of my understanding, or I'm not, I'm disconnected from the society of fucked up people called addicts in order to perpetuate what I don't want to be again, right? Like, I mean, why do I go to meetings to hear the the newcomer talk about how shitty it is out there? Because because I might forget, right? And uh, forgetfulness can kill us. Plus, I live in the ghetto, so I mean, I I, I see it every day. It's kind of why I'm grateful for where I live, in the in the area or the geographical location of the city that I'm in. So th- those things are good for me. 
um, people respect me today. Uh, they know I'm not a liar. I'm not a bullshitter. Um, it's funny to feel what dignity feels like again, you know, and it, 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 it see it feels familiar now after, um, the time that I do have running a, a, a I would say a good program and, um, and continuing this program, realizing how this way of living can deal with adversity while still using some of the beneficial, some of the beneficial traits that I have, you know, it's, it's a great life. I mean, it really is a great life. Uh, I cannot, I cannot say that my shittiest day in recovery is like my, the best day in active addiction is still not better than my shittiest day in active sobriety. It's just not, I mean, sobriety is good. It really is good. I'm, I'm grateful for being in control and I love being able to let myself drift away meditating these things, these things I hold solace. And so for the, the last part of this episode, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little reading out of, out of uh, something that I, a book that, that has been near and dear to me. And it says, And acceptance is the answer to all of my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. I can... And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it is supposed to be at this moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake. Until I could accept my addiction, I could not stay sober. Unless I accept life completely on life's terms, I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on what needs to be changed in the world as on what needs to be changed in me and in my attitudes. Like I said, the world doesn't need to change. What needs to change is our attitude looking at the world. I need to change. And my change is going to reflect in the world. Working on myself is beneficial for all that are around me. These are the fruits that are bared to to those who are around me. Is the labor of the love and the unconditional love I have gained for myself. I have found a new appreciation for myself. I can even come out with a date or about the round and about age when I started hating myself. This was about around the age of five. And I know, I know now that I'm lovable. And I know now that I'm worthy of the word unconditional. And how did I get there? I worked for it. I had to prove it to myself. I had to earn it. That shit just didn't come for free. I had to show myself that I was worthy of unconditional love from myself. The only person who ever gave it to me free was my higher power. And my mother comes pretty close. However, she's still a human. And she has faults. But my higher power does not. And he was able to afford this to me freely. I was the one who had to earn the understanding of respecting what unconditional love is. Today, have I achieved that? I believe so. Tomorrow, maybe I'll forget it. But I'm willing to go and do the work to find it again because what I've done today doesn't matter tomorrow and what I'm going to do tomorrow isn't going to matter today all that matters is what's presented in front of me and with that I'm going to close this episode Um, you can visit me uh, at the website I'm going to start putting that up in the description at the bottom of YouTube and uh, also in the in the podcast forums and uh, you can go to Let's Chat and talk to me almost in real time through that that uh, through that website. You just got to make sure you hang out on the website a little longer for me to respond because uh, 
the internet works a little slow sometimes. And uh, you can also check out, like I said, the Patreon page. And wherever you're getting this content, stick it out because the content's going to keep on coming to you wherever you're listening to this. Please share this to whoever you think may need it or it might be valuable to. And uh, until next time, I bid you farewell. And uh, tomorrow's show, like I said, we'll have Kenny in here. I think it'll be a good show, uh, as they always are, in my opinion. Um, And uh, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.